Okay, so you're working on Little Plum today for the Beano. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that come about and how long have you been doing that? Ooh, um, well, I, I kind of got to know the guys at DC Thompson a, a generation back, I suppose, just through being in the industry. And at some point they they asked me if I'd like to work on the dandy, actually, Morris Heggie. Um, but I, I was too busy doing other stuff at that time. So I said no. And then some years ago, about 10 years ago, I had a, a very bad patch where suddenly my income dropped by about 30%. And so I phoned up Morris and said, look, do you, can I still work on the dandy? And he said, no, but we'll give you a job on the Beano. Um, so that's that's where I started there. And they, they tried me out first of all on, oh, what was it, some vultures, although that was really just a try out. And then Little Plum, and then uh, one called Fred's Bed, which I didn't like. And then I started doing Rats, which is one I invented. But, but, but with rats, uh, and quite often in the industry, I mean, rats you invented, mm. but that didn't necessarily mean that you owned what no, you created. No, no, they own it, they own it, yeah. So I'm back on Little Plum now, and the rats are retired, but they'll, they could still bring them back, and they could bring them back with another artist as well if they wanted to. The best thing to do is to invent a, a, a character that can be franchised, and I never did that. <laughs> <laughs> Something that's going to be popular, you know. And I've invented lots of characters, but nothing that's ever taken the the popular imagination. Well, I, I think there's a, yeah, I think there's something in your approach <laughs> that kind of mitigates against that in a way. So you, you've got Calculus the Cat, mm. you know, at, at one level is the super media friendly character, but is a character who himself is kind of subverting the media, is is yeah, you know, is 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 taking the piss out of the whole thing. Yes, and, and he always was popular as well with anybody who saw him back in the eighties. And people have been on at me for years to bring Calculus Cat back, you know. And um, so I, I am. I'm republishing Calculus Cat with new material in there, and then I've actually written and drawn a couple of new stories recently. Um, which has been an odd experience because it's been such a long time since I did calculus and television has gone through a you know a revolution in, since then and I, I'm not a television watcher I don't I, I just don't watch it um, and so things like oh cable TV and free view and high definition and 3d TV and interactive and reality TV has gone past me by completely <laughs> and so writing calculus who has this this relationship with his television you know, they, they talk they argue and it's a very one-to-one -one relationship um, it's not like that with TV anymore you know people watch it in a very different way and so I wrote a couple of new stories but they were very much in the old way with there just being this this other thing in the room with him not really television as it is nowadays and I don't think I'll do any more because it's like I say the world of television has changed so much that it'll become the way the way the calculus cat stories work will, will become incomprehensible to, to yeah it, it, it's it's like trying to do a, a story with mobile phones or uh, e-cigarettes now and that yeah that there are there are some things that don't work yeah with that technology which made other older genres of story work really well yes yeah you yes. can't have noir you couldn't have noir stories yeah. with e-cigarettes could you that would just be silly I, and and science fiction it's it, it's interesting it's funny here in science fiction things on the the radio where they're older ones where you've got some um, very advanced ideas and yet there's no computers because they were written before uh computers existed you know so they, there's not even the concept of of uh the internet or anything like that yeah. and and I mean <laughs> there's one I heard the other day a play with these people going to Mars adventure story and they were still communicating in Morse code <laughs> fabulous <laughs> fabulous well, the, the, well, one advance that you have taken advantage of for calculus cat is using kickstarter yeah and um, do you want to tell me more about the, the kickstarter oh kickstarter campaign? well I'm a big fan of kickstarter um the crowdfunding thing it's um uh, we decided we'd do calculus cat through that and 
uh, raise the money to, to publish the thing by asking the public to get involved. And it worked very nicely. Um, and we, we got the money we asked for and a little bit more. And we'll be pu publishing uh, a, a deluxe edition of the book in hardback and all sorts of extras, t-shirts and badges and guitar picks and limited prints. And um, some people will get original drawings, oh, which I'm lovely. knocking off here. There's about seven of these I have to do that some of the backers have, have gone for. Um, and as well as that, we'll be, we, we get a, a regular paperback edition of the book to go in the shops, which is great because like the money we raise from Kickstarter pays for all of that. And what we get out of it is a book to sell in the normal channels that we haven't had to pay to print. So it, it's a, it's a win-win situation. We get the, the, the smashing deluxe edition and the regular one, which is part of Knockabout's publishing schedule. I think cartoonists are like everybody else. You do your best work when you're young. Your first album is always the best one. The second album is always the difficult one to do, you know, as a, as a rock star, say. You know. And, um, and I, I, I just find it more and more difficult to come up with original material plus the fact that I just don't have the time um, I mean I have to I have to pay a mortgage you know I have to have an income and basically that just takes up all the time I have these days and I don't get that from doing original material um, the closest I come to it is working for 14 times the magazine of unexplained phenomena and I've been working for them for I don't know since what was 70 74 i think i was first involved with 40 in times and um for a long time i've done a, a monthly page a monthly comic strip page and i write those those are kind of original um but even there you see i mean it gets all the time it's harder and harder to come up with something new to say about ufos or something every month well, you, did, you did a beautiful, beautiful story for the, the Door of the Unread project. Well, of course we did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what yeah. am I thinking? Yeah. And, and that, please, yeah, if, if you allow me to uh, blow smoke up your ass <laughs> and give you a bit of a barbecue, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Yeah, thank thank you. You. It's, it's, it's got dynamism, it's got energy. Mm. Um, the way it flows across the page and gets you to turn the page works beautifully. Mm -hmm. like, it, it, it's a it's a beautiful piece of work. Oh, thank you. And to me, it's just as strong. Yeah. You know, as well. I mean, know, I couldn't have done that without Kevin because I don't sure. know anything about D. H. Lawrence. You know? Right. Um, but he knows about D. H. Lawrence, of course, because he knows everything. <laughs> but you're the man who wrote the big book of everything. <laughs> um, but um, yes, Kevin Kevin wrote the the, the Lawrence thing. And um, and he, he he told me that Lawrence wasn't by any means one of his favourite writers when he took this project on. But having done it, he's kind of warmed to him a little more, although he's still not one of his favourite writers. <laughs> but I don't know, because I've never read him, you see. Um, although I did do Lady Chatterley's Lover as a comic book uh, in the 80s. But I worked then from a precy. Um, written by Tony Bennett and Carol at Knockabout. And um, I did tr try reading a few pages of Lady Chatterley and sort of working from that direct onto the page, but it wasn't working. But um, I, haven't, I haven't actually read anything of him. Well, you, you did a series of, of those kind of adaptations, you know, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner yeah. and, mm. and Casanova and so forth. Are you, are you thinking of doing more in that direction? Uh, it seems to be the way that things go for me these days. Yeah. I kind of like doing history. Mm -hmm. I love history. And um, we did Dante as well, we did Inferno. Yeah. And Kevin worked on that with me as well. You see, I mean, he was the, the main inspiration behind that. And. Um, Although I wrote the thing, he he did all the research, and that's another of his big things. Is Dante? Is he? He lives in Cambridge, and uh, I went down there to talk about it with him early on. He'd suggested it, and he laid out about thirty-five different illustrated Dantes and to go through, which is fascinating, all the way from Botticelli, who did the worst version, <laughs> <laughs> through to Gustave Dore, of course, and. Uh, 
Tom Phillips. It's all very abstract versions, modern versions. Um, yes, and, and doing these kind of, as, as it were, classic adaptations, it, se it seems to be uh, the way that things go for me these days. I mean, people more and more come to me to do this, like you came to me about D. H. Lawrence. Absolutely, yeah. Because I already have a, a reputation doing this. I already have a, a, a sort of a, a back history. I did some work recently for a, um, a book about uh, of comic book adaptations of World War One poetry, and I got seven pages of. Um, trench songs, you know, the, the, the humorous songs that the soldiers themselves sang. And uh, that again came because, you know, I've kind of got this reputation for doing these sort of historical stuff. And I have a project in mind for the f that, that will come to pass eventually, which is to do a history of Handsworth, which is where we are now, where I live. Um, I'm I'm interested. I think that there's a lot of interesting stories there, and uh, I want to do them as a comic book. And I'll be writing it all and probably drawing most of it, but I'll bring in other people as well. But that's for the future. And, w and which of those jobs have been most enjoyable for you at the time? I mean, you, you know, you've worked for you know Radio Times, for instance, and, and you know other publications. Well, I always prefer doing my own work. Okay. Um, the, the 40 and Times stuff is still the, the, the favourite mm. of the regular work I do now. Firkin the Cat, I'm still doing for Fiesta. Cool. 37 years on or something like that. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, and that's all right. I, I, I work with a writer on that. I always have done, Tim Mandy. And um, I, I enjoy doing them, but it, it's become very much a routine now. Uh, the Beano stuff is basically just work. Um, I don't get a huge amount of satisfaction doing it um, because it's it's just something that has to be done, and it, I have to do it in a day because I have to. I can't justify taking longer than that over them. So it's basically just get the thing down. And what about and how do you? Yeah, how how does the process start for you? So you've got you've got a script. How do you how do you turn the script into your page? Because you you seem to have a really strong sense of storytelling. And, right. And well, actually, uh, that's. I mean, it's it's just a process, you know. Read the script, split it into frames, um, sketch the frames in on the paper, and put the ink on, and that's it, really. But what you say about telling the story that is something that I believe is the case. I, I mean just the, the amount of experience I've had. I know how comics work. I can make stories move on the page. I can read through a six frame or eight frame strip, uh, script and instinctively know that that frame is gonna to have to be split into two to get the action to work. And, and that one can go all together because it's irrelevant, you know. And so I'll do a bit of editing like that. But people have said this bef to me before, is that oh, your comics are very easy to read. Mm. And I think that's just the experience of knowing how the stories work and how to go from frame to frame. I, I, I like cutting things out. Um, writers love yeah. their words. And uh, I know how to edit. <laughs> um, and take out all the fancy stuff so that it basically just tells the story and that's really the best way to do it is you know you have to not treat your reader as a, a, a moron by any means but you have to look as though you not not be too clever about it basically you have to if people are aware that they're reading a comic then you've failed because there, there's something getting in the way of of them and the story. The best thing is if they, they go through it and realise that they've actually read a comic without without reading it. And um, it's the same with drawing it, you see. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, it's good, I'm good drawing frame after frame after frame. But when it comes to doing uh, covers or posters or something like that where it relies on a specific image, I find that really difficult. Um, because it's it's concentrating on the drawing rather than a, a sequence. And uh, that's why my covers, my book covers are never very good. 
I'm never very happy with the covers that I do. They never work quite. And what, and what do you take inspiration from yourself? I mean, you know, looking around the room, I can see, <laughs> you know, Mobius and Crom. Yeah, well, and Jim Wood. John Junkin, the comedy writer, used to say when he was asked this that the unpaid telephone bill by the, the typewriter was the best inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and and really, that's what it is. You know, yeah. I don't, uh, I don't have the luxury of inspiration. You know, uh, I'm a jobbing cartoonist. I'm a hack. I have to pay the mortgage, and so I do whatever comes. And uh, I can I sit down and draw, and um, however pissed off I'm feeling, uh, uh, depressed or whatever, I, I still have the ability to draw funny, even if I don't feel funny. You know, I can draw funny. That's what I do. I can't draw serious, but um, I can knock out big noses and big feet. And, and basically, that's that's it. It's you know, it's a production line, really. Well, thank you very, very much. Okay, thanks, Adrian. An absolute pleasure. Thank you. Will.